So let's look at some examples. Uh, we saw examples earlier for the zero forcing. Now let's see for these examples how the MMSE uh, would perform. So if we look at what's similar and non-similar between the zero forcing and the MMSE, you'll remember both of them involved inverting a matrix. In terms of the MMSE, it was the autocorrelation matrix that we had to invert. And in, in terms of the zero, front, uh, zero forcing, it was the impulse response matrix that we inverted. So in terms of complexity, they're, they're pretty similar. Um, the minimal error, we found, it, found an expression for the zero forcing um, uh, equalizer, which was based on um, the noise enhancement going on with the inversion of the channel. Uh, in terms of the error in this case, it would be the uh, difference in the uh, variance of the data itself and the um, variance which uh, comes from this uh, set of optimal coefficients. So we do have an analytic expression for the minimal error that we can achieve. So there would be, uh, for any set of um, coefficients, this would be the error, mean squared error, and when I get the optimal that minimizes this, this would be the error that I cannot reduce. This is the minimum mean squared error. So, as I said, we're going to look at the same channels that we looked at previously for the zero forcing. Remember, there were three different ones. The blue one's a little bit more benign, and the uh, pink one has a fade at lower frequencies, and we can see a slow roll-off fading uh, in the uh, red at higher frequencies. So let's look back at what we had for the BER for the zero forcing. And we saw that the blue was pretty uh, easy to uh, equalize, but the red and the pink were both pretty bad. So what happens when we come with the MMSE? Well, we can see we can do uh, more correction in uh, this uh, case. In fact, uh, before, uh, especially with the red, we see that the red, we're getting much better performance than we did equally uh, er earlier with the pink. So the pink has got that null. That null was a bit worse, but the two were pretty bad. But now we can see the MMSC is really spreading these things out. And it's still pretty bad for the pink, a little bit better. But the red, we've gone a long way with the MMSC. So you can see, you know, which is better, MMSC or zero forcing? Well, it depends on the channel. And there are channels where we're going to get more improvement, channels where we're going to get less. And if we look at the frequency domain, we might get some clues on what we expect in terms of the improvement. And here, of course, there's the quantified version for these uh, specific channels. So as I said, there are a couple options that we can select for uh, equalizers. Uh, the time between samples being the most important one. And typically, I mentioned that we would be doing the symbol time. Uh, the examples we looked for zero forcing, we assumed that this was the case. Uh, it seems to be a good compromise between the complexity and the performance. So how, how many, uh, it, of course, if I make faster um, samples, then I will ha have for the same memory length, okay? So I have memory length in the channel. And then I say, well, for that memory length, I should have a filter about this many taps. And that should give me good performance. And if, if I want to do sampling, which is faster, that means I'm going to double, or if I do twice as much, uh, twice as fast sampling, I would double the number of taps to look at the same observation window. So it's possible to have what we call fractionally spaced equalizers. And the typical fractionally spaced would be two times over sampling. And that will give you better performance. Uh, it does better, uh, but of course, it's, it's a big up in complexity. So there's this trade-off between complexity and improvement in performance. Um, if the delay in the channel is smaller than one symbol interval, then I'm really going to need to use a fractionally spaced e equalizer in order to really uh, capture uh, what's going on in the channel, because otherwise I just, I'm not going to see it because I'm not sampling fast enough. So um, that's a, a kind of example where the increase in complexity is really required in, in order to get a good improvement. Uh, it, it's also a way of hedging um, the performance in the presence of a clock which is not very stable. So if the clock has a lot of jitter in it and your sampling times are not exact, well then oversampling will be able to automatically correct for that without actually improving your clock. You'll just get as if you had a good clock and 
regular symbol uh, sampling or oversampling with a bad clock, they'll give you pretty much the same performance. So I'm going to take one particular example just because it's easy to uh, calculate analytically uh, the, those expected values that we, we looked at er earlier. Uh, suppose I have a very simple multipath channel, just a two, um, ch two, uh, uh, two non-zero elements in the impulse response. We have the line of sight, direct path, and we have one that's delayed exactly by one symbol period, and it has some uh, value where, where the signal is attenuated, which I'll call beta. So this is one, direct through, no attenuation. Here, beta is smaller than one. And uh, again, I need knowledge of the channel to be able to do these calculations and to know analytically what is the performance of this channel. And uh, in this case, it's parameterized by beta. So uh, knowing beta, I know everything about this channel, and I can analyze the performance. So if we do that, uh, we find that the, efficient, uh, the coefficients for the MMSE filter are given by these expressions. It's based on what is this beta and what is the signal-to-noise ratio, EV over N0. Uh, as the signal-to-noise ratio changes, the coefficients will change, which makes sense because the MMSE is sensitive to the noise level and trying to minimize it. So let's look at any particular example. Uh, suppose I look at beta equal 1 half and EB over N0 equal 10 dB. Well, then these would be... Um, uh, these are the coefficients of the channel, <laughs> sorry. This is the coefficient of the, um, uh, the filter. So uh, based on this, I could uh, sweep through EB over N0 and find out what is the best uh, filter at each one of these points and uh, plot what is the performance of that. And so that's what we see here. And so we first put in a reference curve, and this is the theoretical curve for a signal I think this is BPSK, uh, where we have no ISI. So it's not that channel with the reflection. Uh, it's just the channel with only the main path, nothing else. Now I say I've got this reflection, and I don't do any equalization. I just live with it. And you can see this big uh, deterioration in performance of, like, you know, let's say, 5 dB or something like that. Then I put in the MMSE, and for this value, we can see that the uh, improvement that we're able to achieve. So this is an example where we can actually use the uh, theoretical uh, formulation to plot what would be the performance of this equalizer. So the MMSE equalizer has a simple structure. Uh, we have to calculate the correlation matrices in order to find the coefficients of the, this equalizer. It, what's nice is it exists for all channels. In the zero forcing, when we essentially are looking for the inverse of the channel uh, frequency response, a channel frequency response with deep nulls, it didn't exist. Well, that formulation doesn't happen here. It always exists, the MMSE uh, filter. Uh, suppose that I am in a very, very high signal to noise ratio region. Well, if I'm trying to minimize the error, and that error could come from ISI or it could come from noise. If there's not much noise, because I got a really strong signal, well then all of the errors are coming from the ISI. And so this uh, filter is going to try and minimize that ISI and it's going to be the same filter as a zero forcing filter. So there's a place, a region, where these two equalizers are actually equal, the zero forcing and the MMSC. And that's in very low noise or zero noise. So then they would be the same filter. But, of course, if there is noise, there'll be divergence, how much noise or, or how um, big a null in the um, frequency response of the channel, then maybe there would be a bigger deviation between these two solutions. But, you know, even if it does minimize the squared error, of course, there's still a signal-to-noise ratio penalty. I mean, it doesn't mean that it can fix it perfectly. That, that is not possible, uh, except in some benign channels, uh, but um, there, there's usually a penalty associated with it. So if we look now at the taxonomy, what have we accomplished here? We've looked over the linear, and we've looked over the minimum mean squared error and the zero forcing uh, solutions 
in the linear uh, regime. Now, what was left afterwards were these last two, and these were the adaptive versions of these filters. So what I've shown you so far has been how do I calculate these when I have perfect knowledge of the channel and, um, and the channel is fixed. So what happens if I don't know the channel or the channel is changing? So even if I knew it, I'd have to find it again and again. Well, then I would use these adaptive 